M-I-L, and S-L broke into my house, your husband's dead, get out. They said, meanwhile, my husband, my name is Anna. I'm 34 and married to the love of my life, Michael. We live in a cozy house I inherited from my parents, nestled in a quiet suburb. Michael and I have been trying for a baby, but it's been a road marked with heartaches. I've had miscarriages, and each one feels like a piece of my heart being chipped away. Michael is a kind man, the kind who'd give you the shirt off his back. That's exactly what he's been doing for his family. His mother, Mrs. Thompson, and his sister Laura, with her two kids, have always relied on him. Laura's divorced and lives with Mrs. Thompson, trying to maintain a lifestyle that her alimony can't support. This morning, as I was setting the breakfast table, Mrs. Thompson walked in, her voice dripping with fake concern. Anna, dear, I was just telling Michael how brave you are coping with, well, you know, she said, glancing at my empty womb. I forced a smile. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson, we're hopeful. Laura sauntered in, her eyes scanning the room like she owned the place. Michael, aren't you a saint, supporting us and dealing with everything, she said, throwing a pitying look my way. Michael, ever the peacemaker, quickly changed the subject. Let's enjoy breakfast. I've got news about the house. As we sat down, Michael announced, I've put all my savings into this house. It's our future, Anna's and mine. So I might need to cut back on some expenses. Mrs. Thompson's face tightened and Laura dropped her fork. But Michael, what about us? We depend on you, Laura exclaimed. I know, but Anna and I need to plan for our future too, Michael replied, his voice firm yet gentle. After breakfast, as Michael left for work, Mrs. Thompson pulled me aside. You do realize, dear, if you can't give him a child, our Michael might rethink this whole arrangement, she whispered venomously. I felt a lump in my throat, but managed to say, Michael and I are in this together. We'll figure it out. As they left, I stood in the doorway, watching them drive away. I knew this was just the beginning. The house, my sanctuary, was now a battleground, and I had to brace myself for what was to come. Life at home became a constant juggling act. Michael left for work early and came back late, often tired and oblivious to the tension that filled the house during his absence. The days were long, filled with silent battles and unspoken words. It was a Wednesday, I remember, because that's when Laura usually dropped her kids off at our place, treating it like some free daycare. I was in the kitchen, brewing coffee, when Laura strolled in, her kids trailing behind her. Anna, make sure they do their homework, okay? I've got errands, she said, barely looking at me. Of course, Laura, I replied, trying to keep my voice even. But I also have things to do today. She waved her hand dismissively. Oh, you can manage. What else do you have to do around here, anyway? After Laura left, her kids, Ella and Max, sat at the kitchen table. I tried to help them with homework, but my mind kept drifting to Laura's words. It felt like she saw me as nothing more than a convenient helper in her busy life. Later in the afternoon, Mrs. Thompson dropped by. She had a way of entering without knocking, as if she owned the place. Anna, dear, I need to talk to you about something, she said, sitting down uninvited. What is it, Mrs. Thompson? I asked, bracing myself. It's about Michael. He's been working so hard. I'm worried you're not taking good enough care of him. A man needs his wife to be more supportive, she said, her eyes scrutinizing me. I do my best, Mrs. Thompson. Michael knows that, I replied, feeling my cheeks warm up. She sighed, a theatrical display of disappointment. Well, I suppose you do what you can. But remember, a happy husband is the key to a happy home. And right now, this house doesn't feel very happy. Her words stung, but I kept my composure. I'll keep that in mind, I said, even though every part of me wanted to tell her how unfair she was being. As evening approached and Michael returned, the atmosphere changed. Mrs. Thompson became the doting mother and Laura turned into the caring sister. They laughed and chatted with Michael, making the house seem like the happiest place on earth. But I knew better. I knew the warmth was superficial, a facade maintained for Michael's sake. Behind closed doors, their true colors showed, colors of indifference and selfishness. And I, caught in the middle, 
had to find a way to navigate through these turbulent waters, holding on to the hope that someday things would get better. The situation at home started to eat away at me. Laura's constant demands and Mrs. Thompson's subtle digs became a daily ordeal. My conversations with Michael about his family were going nowhere. He just couldn't see what I was dealing with every day. One evening, after a particularly hard day, I decided to bring it up again with Michael. We were in the living room, the TV playing some show neither of us was watching. Michael, we need to talk about your mother and Laura, I said, turning off the TV. He looked up, surprised. What about them? It's just, they're here all the time and it's really starting to get to me. Laura leaves her kids here without even asking, and your mother. She has a way of making me feel small. Michael sighed, running a hand through his hair. Anna, they're family. They're going through a tough time. We need to be there for them. But what about us, Michael? What about our life together? I asked, feeling a mix of frustration and sadness. He was quiet for a moment, then said, I know it's hard, but they need me. They need us. Can't you just try a little harder for me? His words felt like a slap. Try harder? Michael, I'm at my breaking point. I need you to see that. There is a long silence, the kind that's heavy and filled with things left unsaid. Finally, Michael stood up. I need some air, he said, and left the house. I sat there, alone, feeling more isolated than ever. The man I loved, the man I'd hoped would be my partner in all things, seemed miles away, lost in a sense of duty to a family that didn't respect me or our marriage. The next day, things got worse. Laura came over, unannounced as usual, but this time she brought boxes of her stuff. What's all this? I asked, bewildered as she started to fill the living room. I'm moving in for a while. Mom's house is just too cramped with the kids and all, she said, as if it was the most natural thing in the world. Moving in? Here? I couldn't hide my shock. Yeah, just for a bit. You don't mind, do you? After all, we're family, she said with a smile that didn't reach her eyes. I stood there, watching as my home, my sanctuary, was slowly taken over. The sense of invasion was overwhelming. I felt a deep sense of loss, not just for the peace of my home, but for the understanding and support I so desperately needed for Michael. That night, lying in bed, I realized that something had to change. I couldn't live like this, constantly pushed to the edge in my own home. The breaking point had been reached, and it was time to make some tough decisions. For my sanity, for my marriage, something had to give. Laura's move into our house felt like an unwelcome invasion. Every morning started with the chaos of her kids running around and her taking over the kitchen as if it were her own. Mrs. Thompson visited more frequently, adding to the tension. One morning, I found Laura sprawled on the couch, flipping through a magazine while her kids made a mess in the living room. I barely had my first sip of coffee. Laura, could you please keep an eye on Ella and Max? They're making quite a mess, I said, trying to keep my tone light. She glanced up unfazed. Oh, they're just kids, Anna. Let them be. You're too uptight. I clenched my jaw, feeling a surge of frustration. It's not about being uptight, Laura. This is still my house, and I'd like to keep it somewhat orderly. Laura rolled her eyes and went back to her magazine. Fine, I'll handle it. But you could be a little more accommodating, you know? Her words stung, and I left the room, feeling a mix of anger and helplessness. Later that day, Mrs. Thompson arrived. She walked in without knocking, as always, and started criticizing the moment she saw me. Anna, dear, this place is a mess. What have you been doing all day? She said, surveying the room with a look of disdain. I've been trying to work from home, Mrs. Thompson. It's not easy with the kids around, I replied, my patience wearing thin. She tisked and shook her head. A good wife would manage better. You should take lessons from Laura. She knows how to handle a household. I bit my lip, holding back the retort that was on the tip of my tongue. Arguing with her was pointless. That evening, when Michael came home, the house was buzzing with his mother's and sister's laughter. As usual, they transformed in his presence, becoming the picture-perfect family. I watched them from the kitchen, feeling like an outsider in my own home. When Michael came in to get a drink, I couldn't hold it in any longer. Michael, this can't go on. Your sister and your mother are taking over home. 
I feel like I'm living in a stranger's house, I said, my voice trembling with emotion. Michael looked surprised, then concerned. Anna, I had no idea it was this bad. I'm sorry, I'll talk to them. His words offered a glimmer of hope. But deep down, I wondered if anything would really change. The invasion of my privacy and space had taken a toll, and I wasn't sure how much more I could take. The house that once felt like a haven now felt like a battleground, and I was losing ground every day. The day unraveled into a nightmare I could have never imagined. Laura and Mrs. Thompson burst into the house, their faces twisted with a ghoulish glee that sent chills down my spine. Anna, pack your things. You need to leave now, Laura announced, barely able to contain her excitement. Stunned, I stammered. What? Why should I leave my own house? Mrs. Thompson, smiling in a way that curdled my blood, said, Oh dear, didn't you hear? A policeman just called. Michael was hit by a car near his work. He's dead. And now everything here is ours. My world stopped spinning. Dead? Michael can't be. I couldn't finish the sentence, the words dissolving into a sob. That's right, and since you have no children, this house reverts to his family, us. So, you need to leave, Laura added, her eyes scanning the room like she was already calculating its worth. I felt numb, my heart aching in a way that defied words. But this house, it's mine, I inherited it, Mrs. Thompson snorted. That doesn't matter now. Michael's gone, and we're his family. We'll be taking over. They began to walk around the house, appraising each item, discussing how much they could sell things for. Their callousness in the face of my supposed tragedy was surreal, almost like a twisted play being acted out in front of me. But the police? They called you? I asked, my voice barely a whisper, clinging to some thread of hope that this was all a mistake. Yes, dear, they said they identified him by his broken cell phone, Mrs. Thompson said casually, examining a vase as if deciding its fate. I sank into a chair, my mind racing, trying to grasp the reality of Michael's death and the vultures circling around his memory. The home we had shared, filled with love and dreams, had turned into a cold, mercenary ground. As they continued their morbid inventory, something inside me broke. The grief, the shock, the sheer inhumanity of it all. I was supposed to be mourning my husband, not defending my home from these, these scavengers. But as I watched them, a small, defiant part of me began to rise. Michael wouldn't have wanted this. He wouldn't have wanted me to be cast out by his own family, especially not in a home that was rightfully mine. I knew then that I had to fight for Michael, for myself, and for the life we had built together. As Laura and Mrs. Thompson continued their macabre appraisal of my home, a sudden noise at the door made us all freeze. The door opened, and to my utter disbelief, Michael walked in, alive and unharmed. For a moment, I thought I was dreaming. Michael. I cried out, rushing to him. What's going on here? Michael asked, his eyes quickly moving from my tear-streaked face to his sister and mother, who stood there in shock. Michael, they told me you were dead. I sobbed, clinging to him. Mrs. Thompson recovered first, her voice trembling. The police called. They said someone was hit by a car, and they found your broken phone with him. Michael's expression hardened. My phone was stolen near my office this morning. I reported it, but didn't expect this. Laura stammered. We thought, we just assumed. You assumed I was dead, and decided to throw my wife out of her own house. Michael's voice was cold, a tone I had never heard from him before. Mrs. Thompson tried to interject. We were just... No, Mom. Enough. Michael interrupted her. Stop playing the show. I heard everything. I can't believe you would stoop this low. I stood there, still in shock. But a wave of relief washed over me. Michael was alive, and he saw the true colors of his own family. He turned to me, his eyes softening. Anna, I'm so sorry. I should have seen what they were really like. Laura and Mrs. Thompson, now realizing their plan had crumbled, began to scramble for excuses. But Michael wasn't having any of it. You need to leave now, he said firmly. But Michael, this is our family home. Laura protested weakly. It's Anna's home, Michael corrected her. And you have no right to be here after what you've done. 
As they gathered their things, I looked at Michael. He seemed like a different person, stronger and more resolute. The unveiling of his family's true nature had changed something in him and in us. After they left, the house was silent, but it was a comforting silence. Michael and I sat down, a million words unspoken between us. We had a lot to talk about, a lot to heal from, but in that moment, I knew we would face it together. The unveiling had been painful, but it was the start of something new for us. A new beginning, built on truth and a renewed bond. The aftermath of the revelation left Michael and me sitting in a heavy silence. He was the first to break it, his voice low but filled with a newfound determination. I can't believe my own mother and sister would do something like this, he said, shaking his head. I took his hand, finding strength in our shared disbelief. I know, it's hard to understand, but at least now we know their true intentions, Michael nodded. They only cared about the money, the house, not about us, not about you. I sighed, feeling a mix of sadness and relief. I try to tell you, but I never imagined it would come to this. We need to set things straight, Anna. I need to make sure they never do this to us again, Michael said, his jaw set. The next day, Laura and Mrs. Thompson came back. Their demeanor changed. They were no longer the confident, greedy women, but seemed almost sheepish. Michael, we, we didn't mean for things to go this far. Laura started, avoiding eye contact. Yeah, it was just a misunderstanding, Mrs. Thompson added, her voice lacking its usual authority. Michael looked at them, his expression unreadable. A misunderstanding? You celebrated what you thought was my death and tried to kick my wife out of her own house. There's no misunderstanding there. I stood by Michael, feeling a surge of pride in his resolve. Laura fidgeted, looking anywhere but at us. We just, we thought we were losing everything. We panicked. And that justifies your actions? Michael's tone was incredulous. Mrs. Thompson tried to reach out to him. Michael, you're our family. We just got scared. Michael stepped back. Family doesn't do what you did. I can't just overlook this. The air was thick with tension, and for a moment, nobody spoke. Then Michael continued. I want you both to leave. We need space and time to heal from this. Laura and Mrs. Thompson exchanged glances, realizing the gravity of the situation. Without another word, they left, their heads bowed. Once they were gone, Michael turned to me. I'm sorry, Anna, for everything. I should have listened to you. I hugged him, feeling a weight lift off my shoulders. It's okay, Michael. We'll get through this together. That evening, as we sat in our living room, the house felt like ours again. The intentions of Laura and Mrs. Thompson had been exposed, and in facing that ugly truth, Michael and I had found a new sense of unity. We were ready to move forward, leaving the pain and deceit behind us. A few days after the unsettling revelation, life seemed to return to a semblance of normalcy. That was until Mrs. Thompson and Laura showed up again, acting as if nothing had happened. They barged into the living room where Michael and I were sitting, sipping our morning coffee. Michael, we've been thinking. We still need your financial support, you know, for the kids and the house, Mrs. Thompson stated, her tone demanding. Laura chimed in. Yes, Michael. You can't just abandon your nephews. They need your help. I looked at Michael, sensing his growing frustration. He set down his cup with a calmness that belied his anger. Mom, Laura, after everything that's happened, you still expect me to support you financially? Michael's voice was steady but firm. Yes, it's your duty as a son and a brother, Mrs. Thompson insisted, her eyes hard. Michael stood up, his resolve clear. No, Mom. I've made my decision. I'm not going to continue supporting you like before. I have my own family to think about. Laura's face turned red with anger. But you have nephews, Michael. They need money. Michael looked at her, then at me and said, I will support my nephews, but in a much more limited way. Anna and I have plans. We're going to adopt a child. I gasped, a pleasant shock washing over me. Adoption? The idea filled me with an unexpected joy. Mrs. Thompson and Laura looked at each other, their faces twisted with anger. You're choosing strangers over your own blood? Laura spat out. It's not about that, Laura. It's about building the family I choose. 
Michael replied, his gaze unwavering. With no further words, Mrs. Thompson and Laura stormed out, their departure leaving a trail of tension in the air. Once they were gone, Michael turned to me, his expression softening. Anna, adopting a child is just the beginning. I believe we will have our own children too one day. His words, full of hope and promise, brought tears to my eyes. I reached out, taking his hands in mine. Michael, that's the most wonderful thing I could hear. A family, our family, however it comes to us. We embraced, a sense of peace enveloping us. The challenges we had faced with his family had only strengthened our bond. Now, looking towards the future, we saw a world of possibilities. A world where our love could extend to a child in need of a home, and perhaps one day, to children of our own. The chapter of struggles and pain was closing, and a new chapter, full of hope and love, was beginning. Together, we were ready to write it, one day at a time.